So a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, uh, good evening, India. Good morning, America. Good night. Good evening in Tokyo. And uh, and greetings to everyone from other geographies. Uh, excellencies, uh, distinguished panelists, uh, friends from India and all over the world, ladies and gentlemen. It's my delight and uh, privilege to welcome you to today's virtual panel discussion entitled The Quad Way, A Force for Global Good. Uh, my name is Manish Chan. I'm founder and CEO of India Rights Network and Center for Global India Insights, a think tank, a think tank of foreign strategic advisory that focuses on geopolitics and actionable foreign policy analysis. We also publish India and the World, a foreign policy magazine journal that has carved a niche among the diplomatic and strategic community in India. For more on our organization and activities, you can log on our website, www.indiarights.org. In the last few years, uh, we have organized several seminars, physical as well as virtual, on different reasons and themes. These panel discussions have been marked by the participation of eminent speakers, very high quality of discussion. We hope that our webinar today will live up to our reputation and raise the bar for informed discussion of foreign policy issues. This webinar builds on a panel discussion we had organized in the aftermath, the first in-person summit in Washington last year called Quad, the Power of Food. Uh, dear friends, we are meeting at a time when the world order continues to be assailed and challenged from South China Sea, South Pacific Islands, and from Ukraine to Myanmar, making uncertainty the only certainty in the world. On a beautiful, radiant afternoon in Tokyo on May 24, the leaders of India, Japan, Australia, and Japan, leaders of India, Japan, Australia, and US scripted a new chapter in their journey, marked by solidarity, creativity, and action-oriented cooperation to secure the rules-based order against coercive, provocative, and unilateral action that change the status quo and violate sovereignty of the nations. I was there in Tokyo for this summit, privileged to see all this upfront. The rapport and connect among the leaders of the public was quite visible. What was remarkable was that the four of them, the four leaders, spoke in a similar language about shared interests, including freedom of law, democratic values, and respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity. The overarching message coming out from the Tokyo summit were loud and clear. Pulling and coercion will not be tolerated, but stoutly resisted by the region and special quad countries. The Tokyo summit, in a sense, marks the visible movement forward as a pressure group, as a formidable pressure group against three C's, chaos, coercion, and conflict, and has come to be associated in the public mind with three G's, that is good, growth, and goal-oriented. Like before, there were no explicit, or like before in the previous editions of the Quad Summit, there was no word mention of China in the Quad Joint Statement, but Beijing was the subtext of the intra-Quad discussion. Intra-Quad uh, cooperation to maintain freedom of navigation in the South China Sea, prominently in discussion, culminated in a joint statement to champion adherence to international law, particularly as reflected in the UNCLOS and the maintenance of freedom of navigation and oversight. Many key initiatives that emerged from the Tokyo summit were animated by the collective strategy to constrain China's rules-based, uh, rules-bending behavior. These included, among others, the Indo-Pacific Partnership for Mar Maritime Domain Awareness, IPMDA, and the establishment of the core partnership on humanitarian assistance and disaster relief in the Indo Pacific, in a move designed to provide an alternative to China led Belt and Road Initiative. Four leaders also decided to extend more than $50 billion USD infrastructure assistance and investment. 
put together these multifarious but interlinked initiatives mark the consolidation and strengthening the geopolitical agenda of the future. Now, very briefly, let me unpack the master theme of today's webinar, the broad way of force for global good. There are two parts of this formulation. First, the forward way. The panel today will explore and discuss whether there is any such thing as a quad way, or is it just a feel-good rhetorical construct? If there is a quad way, then what are its distinguishing features? Uh, President Joe Biden has provided some pointers in his remarks at the Washington summit, as well as at the Tokyo summit. He underlined that the quad is a vivid example. Democracies deliver better. The second part is about the court's positioning and branding as a force for good, a formulation first proposed by Prime Minister Modi in his address at the first in-person summit in Washington. And this message was amplified again at the Tokyo summit. The joint statement of the Tokyo summit endorses this formulation of the court as a force of good. This formulation has to be seen against the backdrop of attempts by some countries to portray Quad as a divisive force or an Asian NATO, we know who we are talking about. In this context, the discussion today will look at how the Quad countries can collaborate, promote the Quad. Looking ahead, the webinar will try to explore and map future directions of the grouping and the role it can play in promoting peace, prosperity, and stability in the Indo Pacific. The, I mean, going by the four summits we had, virtual and too physical, the quad is looks like that to go from strength to strength. And not only uh, the quad is not only set to grow, but will branch out probably new areas such as space coverage, infrastructure building, and maritime main awareness as identified by the May 24 uh, summit. At the webinar today, we have seasoned diplomats and analysts who will address the gathering very distinguished gathering. And we have a truly stellar panel. Uh, let me introduce them very briefly right now. Uh, Dr. Arvind Gupta, Director, Vivekanand International Foundation, uh, VIF, a prominent Delhi-based think tank. Uh, Mr. Tomohiko Taniguchi uh, needs no introduction, uh, like all other speakers, but uh, basically, he was, he served as advisor, former Prime Minister Shinji Abe, and those who know he was the driving force behind that iconic speech called Confluence of the Two Seas. We have Sachin Chaturvedi, uh, Director General at the RIS, Research and Information System for Developing Countries. He's an author and a prolific uh, speaker and commentator on foreign policy issues and issues relating to development cooperation. We have with us uh, Honorable uh, Lisa Singh, head of Australia India uh, Center, with a sterling job uh, in promoting and strengthening uh, uh, India Australia relations. And the kind of momentum you see uh, in India Australia partnership uh, is partly also driven by people like uh, the Honorable Lisa Singh. Uh, Richard Rosso the senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where he holds a Wadwani chair in India-US policy studies. His writings uh, illuminate different facets of the burgeoning partnership between India and United States that President Obama has famously called the defining partnership of the 21st century. And last but not the least, uh, Madam Nancy Snow, who's a public figure, uh, a professor of public diplomacy, uh, uh, communication specialists and many more. And of course, a prolific commentator foreign policy issue. So we have a truly eclectic uh, audience from different geographies. We have two speakers from uh, Japan, from India, one from Australia. So we have a miniature quad here. And uh, let me uh, go ahead with the this discussion. Just before we, I hand over, I invite uh, speakers to deliver their address in response to my question. Uh, this is for the audience. Uh, you know, I, 
have any questions, there is a chat box. You can type in your question. We'll come back to you. Uh, please tweet about the webinar. Please also type India Rice TGII on Twitter. And now, my pleasure and honor to invite Dr. Arvind Gupta to uh, address some questions about the way ahead for the fall. Dr. Gupta, the Tokyo summit is seen as probably the most substantive meeting of all leaders so far. You know, we have had four meetings. And out of this, Tokyo summit marks the maturation, a culmination of some of the underlying themes that we been building for years. What do you think were the major outcomes that will help India to promote its vital uh, strategic interest? Uh, looking ahead, how should India shape the direction in which the Quad will evolve in the future? And how can Quad play its role as a You have eight minutes. There are many questions linked up, but they're all linked up questions. So uh, whatever you can address, otherwise we'll come back again. Over to you, uh, Dr. Arvind Bhutt. Thank you. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Amanish, for uh, inviting me uh, to this very important discussion and uh, giving me uh, this opportunity to share uh, the panel with uh, very eminent uh, analysts and uh, panelists, uh, some of whom I have uh, heard earlier also. And uh, I think uh, the discussion is very timely. And, uh, I must uh, congratulate you for not only organizing this uh, webinar, but also your masterly uh, introduction, uh, setting the scene for the quad. And I think you made uh, my task uh, easier by uh, focusing on uh, some of the, uh, you know, deliverables of the uh, Tokyo uh, summit, which uh, I don't uh, have to cover now. Uh, but I think the questions uh, you have framed are also very relevant. And uh, I do not know whether I have the answers to all of those uh, questions, but certainly it will help uh, clarify uh, our thinking. The reason I say that is because I see Quad still as a, a process. It is a, a it is a work in uh, progress. Uh, four countries have uh, got together for uh, for I think more than a decade. The Quad was uh, dormant. Uh, then it was revived. But in the last uh, one and a half years, uh, it has certainly gathered uh, pace and momentum. And uh, I think the credit should go to the uh, four uh, leaders, but uh, certainly to uh, President Biden, I think who has uh, shown uh, remarkable uh, uh, leadership. And uh, first by hosting the first summit, and now we have had four summits uh, within a matter of a year or so. So it's clear that uh, there is a great deal of uh, uh, interest uh, in Quad and uh, political commitment to Quad. In fact, the I think the distinctive feature of the uh, Tokyo summit is, uh, I would say, uh, that uh, uh, it was held at a time of great flux in international relations and in the wake of the Ukraine uh, war. Uh, and as uh, is well known, uh, there are differences uh, between uh, India uh, and the other Quad member countries on uh, uh, Ukraine and how to, uh, because India has not named Russia. And this could have, uh, these differences could have derailed the Quad, but that did not happen. And that shows, uh, says a lot uh, about the maturity of the Quad leaders, that they are able to uh, live with the differences. Uh, and the reason uh, I think uh, that is uh, to be appreciated, this uh, tendency, is because in future, too, there could be uh, differences. But since the Quad has developed a very positive and uh, uh, practical agenda uh, in the last uh, two years or so, uh, it was possible for them to focus on some uh, critical issues and not be lost in uh, the, uh, you know, highlighting those differences. So you find that in, uh, uh, although there must have been a, a quite detailed discussion uh, in the uh, closed door meeting, but the statement has only a very, very brief reference to Ukraine, and that I think is uh, good. Uh, so uh, that is, I think, the maturity uh, uh, of the court. 
some new initiatives were also announced, some were continuation. Uh, the agenda continues to expand and uh, the, whether it is climate action or whether it is uh, cyber security or uh, critical and emerging technologies or infrastructure. So you mentioned uh, all of that. Uh, this I think makes Quad a very uh, unique uh, 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 institution uh, that four countries, there are only four countries right now, and they have taken upon themselves a massive agenda, massive agenda, and, and it's a very practical agenda. And this agenda is essentially focused on the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so I think uh, if the Quad countries are able to deliver on uh, these uh, very, very important uh, uh, agenda items, that will be a great plus for Quad. And this is also, I think, uh, where the Quad has to be a little careful also because the, the agenda seems to be expanding so fast, uh, whether uh, they have the uh, capability to implement and deliver in a timely and credible fashion to the diverse countries of the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, region, that I think will be a very big question uh, for the court. So that's, I think, a note of uh, caution is required. And this will also have a bearing on the further development of uh, uh, the court. For instance, on the vaccines, uh, I saw a figure about 600 million doses uh, have been uh, uh, given by the Quad countries to the world. But if I remember correctly, uh, this vaccine initiative was really a defining uh, feature of the first uh, uh, summit. And they had promised 1 billion uh, vaccine doses to the Indo-Pacific by the end of this year. Whether they're able to reach that figure or no, I'm not too very sure right now. Then there are many issues, uh, you know, they have... Uh, uh, identified the many uh, through separate uh, statements uh, clarifying the principles, whether it is on supply chains or critical and emerging technologies, etc. All this is very good, but it should not uh, just remain on paper because uh, to handle supply chains disruptions, to handle critical infrastructure uh, protection or the cyber security, or now you're saying that they're going to have uh, a space also. This is a very big agenda. And whether the four countries alone can do it or no is a question uh, that I have in mind. But it doesn't mean that uh, uh, you know uh, they cannot do it. The fact is that uh, the Quad was started. Uh, the Quad started as essentially a, a security dialogue, but now it has uh, security is embedded in Quad. But I think hard security issues are being shunned. Whether it is good or bad, I think only time will tell because there are huge security challenges. But the fact that the Indo-Pacific itself is evolving and Quad is only just one institution. There are many other institutions which have also come up. For instance, AUKUS is uh, one. And uh, then you have uh, uh, IORA, which is also uh, you know overlaps uh, with the, the jurisdiction of Quad. And then you have uh, ASEAN's East Asia Summit. And then you have all kinds of trilaterals and uh, you know bilateral arrangements that have like between Japan and Australia that have come up. Uh, Malabar exercises are also there. So how does the Quad uh, not overlook these security issues? I think and not uh, dilute its uh, 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 existence and uh, the uh, raison d'etre, in fact, uh, that I think remains to be seen. But having adopted a positive agenda and if it is able to implement, so certainly it can emerge as a force for good. Briefly about India, I think India, in the early years of uh, Quad evolution, India was seen as an outlier. Oh, India is not interested in uh, uh, hard security issues. And India had, uh, in 2018, Prime Minister had given a statement at Shangri-La. He, he had talked about uh, inclusive Indo-Pacific, which meant at that time it was interpreted that India is uh, doesn't want to take on China. But the fact is that we have uh, you know, uh, had a Chinese aggression in 2020. But India has been, uh, I think, uh, careful uh, not to, in, uh, in, in fact, in some sense, restrain Quad from becoming a purely a security alliance. And that's why many other elements have been added. And all the elements which are there in the Quad agenda, they are very relevant for India, whether it is cyber security, whether it's climate action, whether it's pandemics or education or supply chains or critical energy and so on. These are very much a, a part of the Indian foreign policy and these find 
mentioned in all our bilateral uh, you know joint statements that we issue with many other countries etc and there is a huge bilateral agenda which india is following with the, the quad member countries and also in other uh, fora so i think uh, the, uh, the quad is a very useful uh, uh, forum for uh, india and uh, it also gives a certain visibility to india uh, both at the uh, regional level and at global level and it can it has already helped shape the quad and its present shape is very much, in fact many of the uh, quad formulations are as if straight from uh, indian uh, formulation for instance the one on terrorism that is there which is so critical uh, for india that is very much there and the last uh, statement also mentioned uh, mumbai and pathan court and also the uh, fatf etc we know what it means so i think this is a very good uh, development so india has been able to uh, leave its stamp on the uh, quad now as far as future is concerned i think uh, there would be uh, uh, a uh, effort to expand the quad's engagement with other countries uh, perhaps the quad is not yet ready to take on new members but i think that uh, uh, demand probably might uh, grow in the future right now quad has to make an outreach first uh, improve its engagement and become acceptable uh, in the indo pacific region there's still many countries in the indo pacific which are looking at quad a bit cautiously because of the china factor that is involved many of them have very uh, you know close relations with china and china itself is very anti quad so i think uh, it will be a while but if the quad is able to deliver on some of the positive agenda i think quad will become more acceptable so in future whether it's europe whether it is with asean or whether it is with other countries i think uh, quad engagement should improve and they must find certain mechanisms of these engagements right now there is no mechanism uh, in terms of uh, uh, dealing with the non quad countries so uh, overall i think i would say that quad is now a very important part of uh, india's foreign policy uh, it's a good vehicle for india to contribute to the shaping of the quad and uh, the regional uh, order and also benefit from uh, uh, some of the uh, you know agenda items if they are popping thank you uh right uh, thank you dr gupta for that big picture view of you know the quad role in in promoting india's vital national interest apart from that of the region and the expanding agenda of quad now i come to mr tani guchi uh mr tani guchi how do you look at the commitment of the eu japan prime minister is it the first major summit he hosted after becoming the prime minister of the country and it was a very successful summit uh, but in terms of japan's priorities for the quad what would that be and uh, you know i met you in tokyo and spoke to you about india's role and you quite a bit about prime minister modi's contribution to the quad maybe you like to uh, speak a little bit on that as well and finally is there a quad way of doing things over to you mr tanigu thank you thank you manish those are very much relevant questions and i would like to address those questions one by one but first uh listening to uh the previous speakers uh, analyses on quad i have just come up with uh, three points that i would like to share with you the members of the panel and the audience Uh, that is based on the viewpoint of Tokyo that could differ from other viewpoints held by Australia, the United States, India, but nonetheless, Quad from the beginning is about seascape, not landscape. That's number one. Number two, Quad could not have um, come to be uh, come to being. without a new geographic concept um uh pushed forward and that is indo-pacific in the 1980s if you look back then two prime ministers of australia and japan got together and come up came up with a geographic concept of asia pacific based on that geographic concept um came into being 
the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, APEC. Um, fast forward to 2010s, it was Shinzo Abe, based on his parliamentary address, Confluence of the Two Seas, proposed a new concept of Indo-Pacific. And Indo-Pacific concept uh, uh, always being mentioned, is always being, being mentioned with an adjective of uh, free and open. Um, so um, came another concept of free and open Indo-Pacific. We've been talking about the uh, Quad being a seascape uh, gathering, and then uh, FOIP was its foundational concept. Thirdly, um, if um, it had not been for very much an outgoing, uh, forward-looking prime minister of India, Narendra Modi, who was willing to break out the uh, known alignment mold, um, quad, or for that matter, FOIP, couldn't have materialized. So those are the three points that I always associate with the uh, emergence of this concept of quad. Quad has been very much important for Japan to widen its breathing space or strategic space. Without it, Japan would likely be cornered into a narrow niche in the Far East or East Asia with the resurgence of a, uh, a gigantic uh, power of China. Also, if you lose Japan, it would automatically mean that the uh, great footprint of the US military uh, would lose its value. So it's, uh, th there is an equation here. If you lose Japan, you will lose US uh, commitment in the region. And that awareness has brought the United States and Japan together to push this quad concept forward. I think there is a great awareness, growing awareness among the Americans that given this massive power of China, it will become even harder still going forward for the United States alone uh, to provide security to the region. So uh, the United States badly needed allies and that alliance relationships been um, readily provided by Japan and by the United States. And herein comes uh, an importance of India because uh, the Chinese are looking at Indo-Pacific as a, a combined sum. And the Chinese Navy is busy building its um, uh, presence in the Indian Ocean. Plus Indian Ocean promises to become almost like the industrial uh, highway for the 21st century's economy uh, with the rise of um, African economies as well. So um, Quad is also about the future. Uh, what else should I say? Because it is about the future, the hip hiccups uh, you have in response to present day uh, challenges uh, should be overcome by the forward-looking nature of the Quad. Uh, coming back to your first question about Japanese commitment, I think it's uh, pleasantly surprising for me to see that previously, uh, uh, the, 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 the Japanese prime minister who was previously dubbed Davish has chosen to be very much uh, buoyant and straightforward about Quad. And I think that tells you something, that there is a very much uh, growing awareness, bipartisan awareness in this country that without an institution such as Quad, uh, Japanese security and the region's security, especially the security pertinent to Taiwan, would be in jeopardy. 
uh, Prime Minister Kishida, uh, as a result, has been very much supportive of that. Uh, people tend to look at Quad as a basket that could contain many different items. I wouldn't disagree with that uh, presupposition, but I would like four leaders to focus their attentions first and foremost on the security environment. After all, had it not been for this gigantic neighbor, Quad could not have um, uh, materialized. Um, so uh, four leaders have to stick to the core thread of Quad, namely security concerns. My final point is going to be that Quad is going to continue to work as a signaling institution. This great signaling effect is very much important that four great democracies always shake hands with each other, work shoulder to shoulder with each other, uh, and to set the goals and hurdles and the rules for the uh, 21st century's economy, thereby providing incentives to our uh, uh, great neighbor of China. I'll uh, stop here and um, uh, look forward to further discussions. Thank you, Mr. Taniguchi, for that, you know, future-looking remarks. And especially, I mean, I really like the description for the Quad as a signaling institution, you know, that every time there is a route spending, a disruptive behavior by China or by any other power, there are these odd countries who can collectively say, look, this is not on, you know, can't get away with this. So that's really the point. And of course, it's also refreshing to see Japan's commitment. We come to uh, the Honorable Lisa Singh. Uh, you know, uh, Australia was once considered the weakest link in the world. But uh, now, with the resurrection of the Quad, Australia has become a strong proponent, uh, champion for the retizer, if I may say. And uh, speculation was right till the very last minute about whether the new Australian PM, uh, Albanese, would be able to attend the Quad Summit in but much to the surprise of man, uh, to make it within hours of the swearing in. And all the leaders commended him. Uh, there could not have been more vivid evidence of his commitment. Uh, so, you know, uh, building on that, what do you think uh, will be Australia's priority for, especially as it hosts uh, the summit next year? And also the unfolding story of India-Australia partnership which also feeds into the, the momentum we are seeing in the uh, board now. Uh, my question to you would be that how will stronger India-Australia relations further move the board? Over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Manish. And um, I, have to, I have to say with due respect, uh, I think, um, you know, there was once a time where the United States was also seen as, as um, a member of the quad that perhaps wasn't uh, uh, so strong, but I mean, we're not in the quad 1.0 anymore. We're in the quad 2.0. And I think that's where the commitment by all four countries is, is fairly rock solid, I would say. And we're, we're in a whole new, new era. And that era, of course, has a number of challenges, but also a number of opportunities, some of which the um, speakers we've already heard this evening have, have shared with us. But from an Australian perspective, uh, something you know has changed here in the last three weeks, and that is we've now got a new a new government, and it really is quite remarkable that uh, on you know one day, uh, our new prime minister was sworn in to office, that the the votes still had not finished being counted, so we did not know whether we had a majority government here in Australia. Uh, and yet the next day, uh, the newly sworn in Prime Minister Albanese was on a plane to Tokyo to meet three world leaders. Um, I mean, really quite, you know, remarkable and also showed 
uh, the new government's commitment uh, uh, to the Quad, um, and also, of course, it, the, the importance of serving Australia's uh, national interests, and also the new government's interests of peace and stability in the region. Um, I think what was made clear through this new government's uh, attendance at the Quad is they put a new stamp on, on what this government's focus is on, which of course is regional security, but it is also very much on a, a more enhanced package on, on uh, aid and development, uh, on diplomatic relations, and most importantly, climate change measures. Um, and I think that was that that signaling was very important by the new Australian government because the next Quad Leaders Summit in 2023 will actually be held in Australia. So it, it, the, the, the sort of the scene has been set, so to speak, uh, by our new Prime Minister um, recognising the importance of climate change. And of course, in doing so, uh, at that Quad Leaders Summit, it was not just to raise it as an environmental issue, but also as a national security issue, particularly in relation to the Pacific. Uh, and, you know, we've obviously seen since the Quad Leaders meeting so much of that play out uh, with uh, the Chinese foreign minister's visit. And of course, our own foreign minister's uh, visit to show uh, our commitment to our Pacific family. And, their, and, and what their issues are. And their issues as has been articulated by, um, by the Fiji Prime Minister is, is not geopolitics, it's climate change. And so I think it was really important that the um, Quad statement had climate change uh, clearly made in there as a point of difference that this new Australian government was bringing to it and to the table. In fact, you know, I think, you know, that the topic of tonight's uh, talk uh, is something that President Biden himself said at the Quad, which is it's the Quad is not a passing fad, it's a force for good. So this force for good, I think, is worth exploring because it does go beyond just the, the security basis by which perhaps we've been looking at the Quad uh, since, you know, since its inception. You know, the fact that we are now focused, of course, of continuing to focus on peace and security and stability in the region, but also looking at future technologies, also looking at a range of a range of issues through its working groups uh, and the like makes makes the quads agenda just so much more broader than than what it what it set out with uh, originally. So beyond those those sorts of uh, three priority areas of this uh, a new Australian commitment that it brought to the quad of regional security, climate change and building, uh, diplomatic uh, relations. Uh, you know, clearly what Australia also wanted to focus on was, was the China factor. And I think this is where, of course, you know, the, the, the leaders focused on the Ukraine-Russia um, conflict. But of course, that, that is a conflict that will, that will come and go, whereas the China uh, situation uh, will remain. And um, th this is where I think, you know, we need to, to have a, a much stronger focus on what we and undoubtedly mean when we talk about the Quad as a force for good, is it's talking about peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific, ensuring a rules-based order in the region uh, and, and ensuring that uh, Quad countries um, adhere to a set of values, uh, a set of common interests, uh, that very much, you know, d define um, um, that that peace and, and rules-based order. But in, in relation to China, if I can just go there, because it is very much an most important issue uh, and foremost security challenge for India, uh, as it is for for other Quad members. I think the threat from China is obviously both direct and indirect. It is conventional and hybrid, and it will continue to play out in in the so-called grey zone. For, for most of the time. But this is where the Quad nations need to pull together to form intelligence gathering, to you know, have a, a, sh a sharing platform and, and structure uh, to, to ward off any and deter any, any threats. Um, and I think that establishment of, a, of intelligence gathering, of a sharing mechanism, you know, ne needs to be sort of what we want to see 
coming out of uh, out of the quad as it, as it continues to be a force for good. Um, I think that um, you know it's also recognised that you know or you know both India and the US have the capability to to sort of balance China militarily, militarily so to speak. Um, but as our, our friend from Japan said, you know, it, this is about seascape, not landscape. Yet for India, of course, it is that shared border with China, dispute, disputed border, that continues to play um, a, a landscape, uh, uh, perhaps, issue. I think one of the one one of the things I wanted to raise in terms of what's new um, in the recent leaders summit is the fact that the Quad is not only just now, uh, you know, a security grouping with a, with a force for good of, of, of other focuses in terms of climate um, and infrastructure um, and humanitarian assistance and the like, but it is also now becoming an economic partnership. And that is something that was new that came out of this particular Quad meeting. And I think it is quite significant and significant in terms of, of of India, um, and and you know, significant in terms of uh, what the next Quad Leaders meeting will also focus on. So this Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity, as it was called and launched at this at this summit, uh, IPEF, um, really is is really going to sort of deepen the cooperation with these four countries in, in the sort of clean energy, supply chain resilience and the digital trade space. And I think what's interesting in that, or what makes the IPF more interesting is, is that it, of course, you know, unlike RCEP, um, the IPEF includes India. So uh, I think that's a really important factor to, to look at. And also, you know, the, these sorts of negotiating pillars it has, it, because it not only includes includes you know clean energy and supply chains, but it includes uh, anti-corruption um, as well. So I think that the, 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 it really helps India, I think, get back into regional trade, uh, some sort of regional trade forum potentially, um, as opposed to you know how India sort of left RCEP. Um, but it, of course, we do need to look in terms of the quad. This is a primarily US-led initiative uh, at this stage. However, you know, I think all all quad quad countries are uh, are, are sort of committed to it. So, look, uh, you know, over and above what Australia sort of saw as the main takeouts of, you know, obviously I've talked about climate change being the most important for for this, putting the new stamp on this new Australian government. Um, you know, I think the, 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 over, the overarching principles that the Quad stands for, freedom, rule of law, democratic values, sovereignty, territorial, territorial integrity, all of that, uh, um, you know, clearly in the Quad's uh, statement and, and reiterated by all of its leaders is what is really the most important factor when we talk about, I think, uh, the Quad being uh, a force force for good. In terms of Australia and India, I mean, what this new Labor government, uh, Labor government has said and, and acted on is that it had a, has a bipartisan position on India uh, as the same as our last government. So I think you will continue to see the Australia-India relationship grow from strength to strength uh, under this government. I think that commitment's been, been made clear and particularly by Prime Minister Modi, who has already invited our new Prime Minister to, to India. Uh, of course, we're hoping that we're signing a new free trade agreement by the end of this year. We have an interim trade agreement that was just recently signed, which has reduced tariffs or, in, or gotten rid of tariffs altogether on certain, certain trading commodities. So, um, you know, I think that that's a very positive signal for both of our countries. Um, and I think the other component of, of, of this government is that we really wants to engage our growing Indian diaspora here in Australia, which, of course, are the second highest tax paying diaspora uh, in the country. So I think there's, there's going to be a lot of scope for the two countries to continue to build the momentum, which has been enormous uh, over the past few years. 
um, to ensure that, you know, not only is there a stronger trading relationship, but of course, a stronger bilateral geopolitical relationship, be it with each right. other or through, through the Quad. Of course, though, having said all that, this new government does have a focus on increasing um, both a street geostrategic lens and, a, and an aid and development humanitarian lens uh, into, into Southeast Asia and into the Pacific. And I think this is where both uh, India and Australia and indeed through the Quad as well uh, can play a greater role in supporting those small island states uh, with, with, with some of the infrastructure needs they need and, and the, in the areas of climate change as well. So, um, uh, you know, I think that's, that's sort of where the, 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 our new sort of uh, Australian perspective lands. Um, I think it's, it's one that's very much in continuum in, in a lot of ways, but also has uh, a, a new defining focus. Uh, and certainly the activities of both our prime minister and our foreign minister in only being in office for three weeks, having already visited uh, Japan, uh, and our, our Prime Minister at least, and, and now Indonesia this week, um, and our Foreign Minister having been all over the Pacific as well, and also to those two countries, I think just shows how engaged uh, this new government is in terms of the Indo-Pacific and upholding those, those important values and, and common interests that, all, that we all have through the Quad. Thanks for uh, William perspective and especially I'm glad that you bring out the geoeconomic part of the board you know Pep and, off, and my next speaker taking off from there would be uh, I invite Sachin Chaturvedi uh, who has done quite a bit of work on uh, trade impacts and trade agreements. Sachin uh, tell me a day before the court summit President Biden unveiled the IPEF Indo-Pacific Economic Framework Parity in the presence of Japanese Prime Minister PM Modi and other leaders, which what joint statement subsequently supported the IPF. How will IPF help in providing economic content to the group wing? You know, so far it was seen primarily as a continues to be seen as, as, as a geopolitics business group wing, security group wing. What about the economic content? How can countries expand trade and investment? And as pointed out by Lisa, you know, uh, after India dropped out of RCEP, is IPEF the big opportunity India has been looking for? Over to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Manish, for this opportunity and uh, uh, for raising issues which are extremely pertinent in terms of how uh, the uh, larger narrative on, on Indo-Pacific is unfolding. I think previous speakers have captured very well, and I must thank uh, 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 Lisa for uh, uh, touching on this very important dimension of RCEP and, and India being uh, out of that. So I think it is, uh, it is extremely pertinent for us to bring in uh, this whole question of how we take this forward. And as Manish, you very rightly said, uh, uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, concept now has uh, these two pillars of security and uh, 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 trade and economic growth. And these two pillars, I think, are now providing the strength, uh, uh, which uh, we heard from uh, uh, Ambassador Arvind Gupta in terms of how we take that collectively forward. And this is, I think, the uh, way IPEF's uh, concept comes in. And I think Lisa is not there that the concept has come from the US. Uh, the, 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 the bandwagon has all the right noises that the US would like to hear. Um, uh, uh, the six uh, uh, features that the US has identified, uh, uh, I mean, if you focus on trade facilitation, which was uh, uh, in uh, Bali WTO ministerial, the low hanging fruit, and, and all of us agreed to that, I think is, is an important dimension of it. Uh, uh, but more, I think, uh, is the concern which uh, we heard from uh, 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 in terms of uh, the supply chain resilience that we need in the region. And, and that, I think, squarely addresses the huge uh, uh, challenge that the region is facing. And that's where, uh, though India being out of RCEP, but being part of what I think helps. It is not only going to be advantageous to, uh, to the countries that are there, but also to our partner countries, particularly countries like Indonesia and others, 
which are also going to be hugely benefiting out of the efforts that we are making for bringing resilience in the region as far as supply chain is concerned. The third part is very much about infrastructure. And we are seeing the downside of the Belt and Road Initiative. It is, it is not just about finance and sovereign debt crisis. It is going deeper there in terms of the carbon footprint, in terms of uh, the monopoly, the whole uh, inflation that we are seeing in terms of China blocking access to containers and the excessive uh, containerization that we could achieve in the last couple of years as part of the collective trade facilitation agreements that came in. The effort that China has made in terms of blocking the oil containers uh, uh, across the regions, I think we, we uh, owe some arrangement to our uh, fellow developing countries in terms of how we do that. And this is important in terms of the third feature of IPAF, which is about infrastructure building, about the trade facilitating measures that are needed uh, for, for investment. And, and this, I think, is important for all the countries that are there. The fourth uh, uh, feature of the IPF, which US has announced, is bringing in the idea of standards for uh, uh, digital economy and technology. And this, again, Manish, I think is, is extremely important given the points that uh, Japanese uh, G20 presidency introduced. And that was largely in terms of identifying how we promote digital trade. India had different positions. India has different position on data for development, on how we leverage data, the cross-border flow of data. But as Prime Minister Modi has been saying, we need to have deeper dialogue in terms of how we overcome these differences. With India assuming the G20 presidency next year, it would be even more important for us to work with Quad countries to see how global consensus may emerge. And that way, the idea of we working together with Japan and with US in terms of standards uh, for digital economy and technology, I think is extremely important. With Australia, uh, a separate track for our uh, trade agreement has already been launched. In fact, uh, Australia and New Zealand are the two countries that are out of that. Otherwise, we already have uh, some sort of trade agreement with each member of the East Asia summit process. And that I think is, is important. Uh, the fifth feature that is there for IPEA for us to consider is about decarbonization and clean energy. Now, the Indian commitment on just transition, the German uh, new proposal that has come up at G7, uh, which fortunately as uh, some of us were invited uh, as part of uh, the outreach of German presidency and the proposal of uh, climate club that has come in, I think is important. There is growing uh, sort of consensus in terms of how we evolve our strategy, but there is consensus in terms of need for strategy, how, how we evolve it, how do we reach there. There are some points of differences. The idea of, uh, of uh, climate club that is being discussed as part of G7 German presidency is very much on table. US emphasis on decarbonization and the uh, assistance that has been given to a couple of countries for just transition, I think is something which is important. India has raised the issue of access to green finance. And this is what I think uh, uh, I would like to mention when, when Lisa was uh, absolutely right when she was mentioning that it is largely led, led by US. I think we need to uh, bring back on the table idea of access to finance and how we do uh, the uh, a sort of uh, delicate balancing between the development space and the climate change. So complete uh, uh, um, uh, blackout on financing of uh, coal, I think is, is, is one important dimension. How much uh, uh, is the uh, agreement at COP26 in terms of the net zero? to what uh, way we've moved towards that uh, net zero, what time for transition we have, and how countries balance uh, mitigation and development priorities. And this is where uh, some differences are there among countries, but I'm sure at the court platform, the countries have endorsed US idea of decarbonization and clean energy as a broad objective. The last point is very much about workers' standards. And this, uh, uh, I think, is important from the point of view of uh, uh, countries that are bringing in new energy. Day. And that's where I think uh, uh, 
uh, uh, Manish, important in terms of the points that Prime Minister Modi raised uh, in 2019 uh, uh, when uh, Indo-Pacific Ocean Initiative was launched by India and, and his emphasis in terms of uh, maritime ecology, maritime uh, resources and capacity building for resource sharing, something that has also appeared uh, in the core declaration. The fact that US could provide uh, scope for quad uh, uh, fellowships, almost 100 of them uh, for uh, students to come to the United States is something which is extremely interesting and, and extremely important from the point of view of how we collectively make the efforts of, uh, of taking that forward also through maritime domain awareness. That is precisely what was discussed. The idea is also on table in terms of disaster risk reduction and, and, and management, something that India was saying. So IPEF, that way, uh, uh, Manish is bringing in the uh, points which are important for the region. They are important for all our actors and also for our partners. I see my time is up. I would stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for those very pithy and pointed remarks uh, on, the, on how to deepen the economic content and I'm also glad you touched on some of those initiatives which bring very tangible benefits uh, to the region, well, disaster mitigation, other aspects. Uh, now I move on to uh, uh, Nancy Kino, uh, who is on public diplomacy uh, initiatives, communication. Uh, Nancy, uh, in uh, Japan, you know, coming back to the question about the uh, quad as opposed to public, the branding of quad, the of the quad. You know, there has been a sustained propaganda, may put it, uh, to represent Quad as some sort of, uh, to portray Quad as an Asian NATO, a divisive and polarizing force. And, uh, uh, you know, this really obfuscates uh, the, the value of the grouping, what the grouping is about. So it's good to see that the joint statement in Tokyo endorses the positioning of Quad as a post public good. And also in this context, you know, there was a meeting of board foreign ministers, Melbourne in February, where information, countering misinformation about board was identified as obligation. Talk briefly about what board, you know, they coordinate their information strategy, public diplomacy strategy, to keep the focus on the on the concrete benefits, people-centric initiatives, which the Quad is trying to teach. Over to you. Thank you very much. And as a public diplomacy scholar and also a propaganda scholar, you gave me a lot to work with here. Um, I'm a US citizen and I'm a Tokyo resident. So the Quad has really hit home with me in terms of security. It's interesting when I live in the US, I may feel less secure at an interpersonal level. Uh, I, live, I live here in Tokyo feeling very secure because of the incredible safety record that Japan overall has. Um, but when I think of this, this slogan really of a force for good, that's a lot to work with as well. I think it can be very appealing to young people and can bring them in, especially if we view security at that level from the interpersonal to international, because not everybody's going to be brought into the quad process and caring about it if they just think of it as military. And uh, when we think of national priorities, diplomatic, informational, military, economic, they've all been touched upon here. But uh, at, the, at this level of becoming a more responsible, democratic member of international society, the Quad has incredible promise. And I wouldn't focus so much as a strategic communications person on trying to defend this uh, counter propaganda to the Quad. If we represent really what the Quad stands for and we deliver, we have specific actions that we deliver on beyond the rhetoric that is nevertheless important, democratic values, uh, focus on climate change, sustainability, 
if we focus on what we do the best, and this is a powerhouse of population and intellect and leadership, then we don't have to spend our energies and emotional energies on trying to resist the counter propaganda. You get pro counter propaganda when you're doing something that is uh, threatening. And uh, but threat doesn't always have to lead to worst case scenarios. It could be competition. And I think that there's an opportunity for healthy competition here. All four quad members deal with China regularly, economically. We're all dependent on China now. And um, I actually teach in China at Schwartzman College at Tsinghua. And I've been involved with Tsinghua for years and uh, teach in Japan. So there are ways that we can be a bridge really here as quad members. Uh, but uh, I, I would like to see beyond the quad fellows to the US, I'd like to see much more engagement and exchange of persons among the quad members. Because I think for the young people I talk to, sometimes 18 year olds, 20 year olds, what do they care about? They care about a sense of security about the future. And for them, that means human security. It's a much broader term. It involves sustainable development goals. And the quad is involved in that. So as a process, as becoming something that I think will go from strength to strength, we need to look at it uh, within this landscape of what does it mean across generations of youth to elderly and really bring in much more of a constituency than just you know elite, elite nation states communicating with each other. So that's why I'm on this panel is to learn from these experts on quad and to help you deliver that message to a broader audience. Thank you. Uh Thank you, Nancy, for very, very precise and pointed observation. And I think this is the way to go. I think the Quad Fellowship was uh, a very important part of what emerged out of it, the launch of the fellowship. It was decided uh, to do this, or decided at the last summit, but finally it was launched. And just to tell me, you know, the young people ask me, when, they, when I talk to them about Quad, they talk about the Quad Fellowship. They are not so much interested in geopolitics, and security, so I'm glad you bring that out, and also the need for better communication about that. Now uh, I uh, come to, uh, I invite uh, uh, Dr. Richard Rosso. Uh, you know, basically I wanted to address this, that, that do you think the Tokyo summit address some of the security issues facing the region? And secondly, you know, Quad over the two last two in person summits have set up various working groups and work streams. Uh, Rick, would you have some specific ideas how to improve, how to streamline those working groups that, you know, uh, Quad can deliver what it intends to? Over to you. Thanks, Manish. Well, it's just a uh... It is terrific too to be the last speaker on such a distinguished group and have at least a couple of ideas that hadn't been brought up yet. So, uh, so that's a lot of fun. Thanks everybody else for for sharing at least a couple of areas. There's three things I'm going to talk about improving today's work streams that we have in the quad, uh, looking at the work streams that have to be built out for tomorrow, and then the future structure of the quad. So today's work streams, you know, it is very focused, and I think primarily because India, you know, mainly has not wanted this to become yet. A, a security focused uh, architecture. It's focused on uh, areas to degrade China's ability to use coercive commercial policies. And that's great. I mean, these are areas that I think all of our countries have faced in the, in the very recent past. You know, you got areas of strategic infrastructure, rare earths and critical minerals, strategic technology, active pharmaceutical ingredients, things like that. I think these are all very welcome. I will quibble a bit, I think, uh, some of the emphasis we've had so far on the uh, working group on climate. I really don't think the Quad is the place for a working group on climate. If we're talking specifically about breaking China's stranglehold on global production 
of things like solar panels, where 70% 70, 70 of all of our solar panels come from China, great. But if it's about strategy on climate, there's other forums that are purpose built for that. And I think, you know, something that Tom mentioned before, this is very much a security focused group, you know, that doesn't fit. Um, the initial quad uh, COVID cooperation did, less so now. You know, it's got to be things that have security and particularly, again, degrading China's ability to use coercive commercial policies. Now, the gap that I see in the work streams as they exist right now is that you don't yet see a avenue or platform to engage the private sector. All of these are going to require private firms from Japan, from Australia, from India and the United States to step up and take advantage of things our diplomats are creating. And if they create architectures and structures and policies and ideas that our private firms aren't ready to grab onto and run with, they're going to be dead on arrival and China will continue to run the table in these areas. So first and foremost, we have got to find platforms for inducting private sector ideas. Do, do we have confidence that our, that our diplomats that are defining the quad work streams really understand how pharmaceutical companies find new sources of active pharmaceutical ingredients? When we talk about regional infrastructure, the United States response is, we don't have a big bank, we're going to rely on the private sector. Where does U.S. infrastructure money come from? It comes from pension companies and life insurance companies. These are the most risk averse industries in the United States of America. And when you talk about some of the markets where we'd be competing with China for infrastructure investment, they don't have developed capital markets. They don't have debt markets. They don't necessarily have perfect rule of law or courts that we can trust. So when you try to get the most conservative investors in the United States to be the spearhead on confronting China's infrastructure investments in the region, uh, it's dangerous. So, you know, mitigating those risks is going to be one of the ways to unlock private sector. But overall, when we talk about, you know, rare earth development, pharmaceutical ingredients, infrastructure, um, we got to make sure private sector has a, a very strong voice. And we also have to be very wary that there's parity in opportunities. If our diplomats are out there and they're carving out new opportunities and all of them accrue to American companies or Japanese companies or Australian companies or Indian companies, if too many of the resulting commercial opportunities do go a little bit heavy to, uh, to a subset of the four countries, uh, that will kind of erode, I think, interest in the others. If India looks at this in three years and says, wow, you know, another $80 billion in trade was unlocked because of the quad cooperation and Indian firms got zero, that's, that's really going to erode interest in continuing to engage. So, so being thoughtful as well, because American companies are terrific at sitting right outside the doors of our State Department or our Commerce Department and, and re realizing an opportunity and jumping on it. We need to make sure that not every opportunity necessarily comes to American firms. So that's some thoughts on today's work streams. Focus on the ones that have security overlay, induct the private sector, and make sure that there's parity. Tomorrow's work streams, there's some areas that are missing. We've talked a little bit on military cooperation. That has got to be highlighted much more deeply in the agenda. We can't wait. China's not waiting. We can't wait. And the Quad is going to be a big deal in pushing back. Now, we need to be thoughtful on this. And I think you saw some initial elements on information fusion, on humanitarian assistance, disaster relief in the most recent Quad Summit. Um, so that's uh, that's pretty important. I think at least, you know, we're, we're nudging there. But, uh, you know, I think we, we could all, <laughs> I think, have a pretty good argument over whose fault it was the Quad collapsed the first time. Uh, hearing the United States get pointed at, that's relatively new, but I understand it. Australia, India come up a lot. You know, at the end of the day, you know, we need to make sure that everybody's interests are aligned. And when the United States announced our, our own Indo-Pacific concept, you know, the first question that came to us from India was, what did the Indo mean? Was it a ploy to drag India into the Pacific conflicts that the United States most security analysts think are tier one? South China Sea, uh, East China Sea, the, the Straits, um, you know, that, that's what at the top level, most American analysts that look at Indo-Pacific think of as the tier one threats. The Indian Ocean is contested waters. And, and many Indian analysts would say that in the next 20 years, India may no longer be the dominant Navy in their own neighborhood. I mean, think about that. We have the moment now where we can head that off, create structures to make sure that that's not the case, that India retains primacy supported by friends, and there's very little being done in that direction right now. And we can't wait. So Indian Ocean, uh, when we think about security cooperation is important. We also need to step into looking at coordinated sanctions. Using our economic heft, when the next time that China announces uh, a, a, a steep a hike on, on, on duties on, on Australian wine, that these four countries consult and immediately come up with a counter package together confer real penalties on China for using economic coercion against any of the Quad members or other friendly nations. 
real penalties. We can do that now. China's and uh, India's announcing bans on Chinese apps. The rest of us should be jumping on board because we know there is no wall between Chinese private firms and information the Communist Party wants to get. There is no wall. We know that. So we should all be acting in concert when we see that there are damages to our population society by some of these steps China takes. Shared investment reviews. China's still trying to make investments in all of our countries. We all have our own process for investment reviews. Are we sharing that intelligence with each other seamlessly? If we find there are dangers to this investor, bam, press a button and get that immediately in the hands of our partners. Even if that same firm is not looking at making an investment in the other countries, make that happen seamlessly and immediately. It's a no brainer, get it done now. And lastly, I would like to see the quad move into some bigger trade agreement, but uh, we can park that for now because I'm already running short on time. Future structure, just two things to mention. Membership comes up a lot. And for me, I think the, the preferred model would be a little bit like the United Nations. These four countries are the Security Council. They, de they define the agenda. They have a veto on other initiatives. But, but lay it out so that other countries can begin to contribute uh, in, in, in the quad work streams and join. They won't help define the agenda, except in spaces maybe we have comfort. But I think a UN structure is very smart. And I do think that uh, we need to start thinking already, if uh, folks in tier one haven't already, about what an actual standing secretariat looks like. These work streams are great, but they're gonna involve a lot of action and daily activities. Uh, and I do think having uh, senior teams from all four countries that are engaging, not just when summits happen, but on a more regular basis, and not just virtually, uh, is useful. Uh, the time may not be quite there yet, but it will be very soon. And I think thinking about that now rather than later is a good idea. So I'll wrap it up with that, Manish, uh, throw a few hopefully new ideas on the table here and have it take any questions. Right. Uh, thanks, Rick. I think being the last speaker helps sometimes. Good to see so much energy in your ideas. And thank you for those very constructive suggestions. Way forward. Now I come to a question uh, from the audience. Uh, the first question is from, uh, wait, let's see. This is an issue which has been talked about much, uh, both in the run up to the Tokyo summit and otherwise. Uh, how has the Russia Ukraine war affected the relationship among the board members? Uh, uh, can Mr. Uh, Taniguchi, maybe you'd like to address that. Has the Ukraine issue uh, impacted the core solidarity? Uh, Rick, maybe you also like to address this. Yeah. First, uh, I uh, ask, uh, I first invite Mr. Taniguchi to take on that question. The short answer to that question, Manish, is not really. Three leaders from the United States, Australia, Japan, uh, seemed to have chosen to be um, less vocal about the stance and position India has chosen vis-a-vis -vis Russia and Ukraine. That uh, evinces the fact that Quad is about the future, not the present. But I should also say that it would have been much, much better if we have heard more from people like you, Manish, pundits in India, clarifying the position of India as to why uh, India does what uh, towards Russia and Ukraine. If I were in that position, I would have said, yes, without ammo coming from Russia, we couldn't fight against Chinese. However, if you look at the tendency, we are buying fewer and fewer, less and less from Russia. Whereas China has increased a great deal, the quantity of ammunitions and uh, weapons that the Chinese are buying from Russia. So you've got to look at the trend line uh, that tells what uh, India is doing with uh, Russia. And uh, Narendra Modi could have said, um, you know that um, India is a democracy. And short of saying that uh, our marriage with uh, Russia is not a marriage of heart, it's a marriage of convenience. 
Uh, I'd say, you know, from, from DC's perspective, I would say uh, outside the administration and even some senior voices in the administration uh, came out pretty harshly and pretty critical of India's position or non-position on the invasion. Um, and I know leading up to our major two plus two summit that took place um, in DC uh, in April, uh, there was a lot of uh, concerns, you know, about how, how we were going to hold the relationship hostage to whether India stepped up at this moment to take a tougher position on Russia. And I would say, luckily, I think the Biden administration decided not to use that moment. And you saw at the last minute, the president himself reached out and wanted to have a, um, a preview conversation directly with Prime Minister Modi, I think, to get the, the ships uh, set on the straight and narrow. That, yes, you know, as friends, we'd like to we'd like to see India's position evolve, but we weren't going to hold the relationship hostage over this. And, and, I'm, and I'm glad to see that happen. I think those of us that, you know, engage at the micro level and see the development of our relationship vis-a-vis the other bigger threat, China, um, and the fact that, you know, frankly, an Indian voice in this debate wouldn't make a big di big difference in Putin's calculations, I don't think. Uh, I'm pretty comfortable. The only downside, I think, is that some of India's position and what you hear publicly is driven, you know, by this Russian disinformation narrative. You know, I was just in Delhi, too, and I constantly hear thrown back at me that it's, it's Ukraine's fault, it's NATO's fault, and it's America's fault, rather than the person that did the invasion. And that uh, this 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 false thing that there had been a promise of no NATO expansion in the East, which even you know, even Gorbachev himself said was not part of the package that gets referred to a lot of times, even in the mainstream in India uh, in media. You, you saw this terrific New York Times expose, you know, where in the weeks after the invasion, the hashtag uh, I support Putin, that almost a quarter of all the accounts, the Twitter accounts that were support that had this I support Putin came from India. And it turns out most of them were bots. So India actually became ground zero as well for the disinformation campaign that Putin attempted to destabilize, you know, the narrative globally. So, uh, you know, I, I wish that some of India's position wasn't driven by these points, but overall I'm comfortable with where we landed and I'm glad the Biden administration has chosen to focus on the long-term. Thanks, Dick. Uh, the next question is from uh, Vijay Nair, the senior journalist talking about what it will take for the Quad, or how can the Quad actually change China's on South China? I mean, talking, signaling is one thing, but can the Quad effectively change China's policy? Uh, may I invite uh, uh, the Honorable Lisa Singh and Arvind Gupta to respond to uh, Well, I mean, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a little bit it's a little bit too far to say that the Quad can change China's policy. I mean, only China can change China's policy. I think what the Quad Quad can do is, you know, is continue to, um, you know, continue to, to to show that it's, you know, uh, unlike what I think China has called it, which is an Asian NATO, that it is it is a grouping uh, that, you know not underpinned by a treaty, not with the secretariat. It, it's, it's, it's a group of like-minded countries that actually have a shared vision of a free and open and connected secure Indo-Pacific. And that they're gonna continue to you know, ensure that those sort of security issues are addressed as, as, as for countries that, that sort of wanna pursue that important agenda for a peace and stable Indo-Pacific region. And, you know, I think the Quad's got a lot of work to do um, to, to, to make that happen. And I think, you know, we've heard a lot from our speakers tonight in that space. And one of those areas I think, you know, we haven't sort of delved too deeply into is the Indian Ocean. Um, you know, this, the, you know, there's a lot of focus on the South China Sea, as the, as the questioner has said. But, but, but the Indian Ocean is, is equally as significant uh, for all sorts of trading routes and and um, security concerns. So, um, you know, I, I think that the, the, the Quad doesn't need to focus on changing China's policy. I think the, the Quad needs to focus on its own agenda. Um, and, and I think you're right. Uh, as Rick said, it, it has got very broad, that agenda. And it, the question's got to be asked, why does it keep adding on and on these working groups um, which yeah yeah are us are, 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 are addressing things that are done in other fora other sort of mini lateral multilateral fora. So um, having said that, I mean we are calling this a, a force for good, and I 
in a sense, I think there are pros and cons to the quad broadening its agenda and showing that it's it's got a, a, a bigger sort of um, security base that, that brings in people, not just the hard power side. But I think that, and that goes back to the fact that, of course, the Quad was created out of a humanitarian crisis uh, with this 2004 tsunami. So, uh, you know, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of sort of focus that needs to be played out, um, particularly in the, in the next leaders meeting. And we need to also take stock of the fact that this, these leaders meetings have only just happened in the last 12 months. So, you know, this is early days. This is an evolving quad 2.0. I think as long as it does, um, you know, continue to focus on the important security agenda for the region, then it, it doesn't really need to keep looking um, at, you know, what's China's policy. It's more what are China's threats. All right. So would you like to add something to this? Um, I'll add something. I love the appearance of your uh, black cat, uh, Lisa. <laughs> and that can be a bad or a good omen, but I'll take it as a very good omen as a cat lover. Um, so I, I think is, is the question about um, the Indian Ocean, I would just like to add that I believe that that may be the lane uh, through which the Chinese Navy could get to the Persian Gulf, right? So that makes it even more significant. And um, we need to pay closer attention to it than just talking about the South China Sea. I mean, to us here in Japan, that's the main focus. But the broader map is really critical going back to Tomohiko's comment about the, the seascape here. All right. Dr. Gupta, would you like to add something? Move on to the next question. About how China can, uh, how Quad can, uh, you know, uh, modify China's behavior and what South China is. South China. I think uh, uh, it's uh, difficult for Quad to change China's behavior. China is not unduly concerned about uh, uh, the Quad. Uh, it has dismissed Quad as a foam on the sea in the past, though of course uh, it is also a uh, concern in one sense that uh, if the military cooperation among these countries increases, then China gets uh, concerned. But the Quad has uh, taken a conscious decision not to focus on hard security issues. And perhaps uh, uh, although China is the subtext of uh, the Quad, but many of these initiatives uh, will bear fruit only in the long term where they can perhaps uh, uh, counter Chinese influence like in the BRI, etc. But I don't think in a, any direct manner the Quad will be able to uh, change China's okay. behavior in South China. Right. Uh, okay, I uh, have a last two, three questions. You know, Quad uh, has taken a major initiative on uh, technology, critical and emerging technology. Uh, this is open to any panelists. What can Quad do to enable uh, technology transfer? Taniguchi, Mr. Rosso, do you have any idea what more can be done in the realm of technology transfer? Uh, what, yeah. Yes, yeah. once again, I would like uh, the Quad arrangement to focus primarily on security issues. Uh, hardcore military security issues, of course, but uh, uh, security issues in more broad terms. Then we are going to be discussing uh, what sort of uh, technology transfers and exchanges should happen among these four nations uh, that are pertinent to beefing up our military and security uh, technologies. So uh, there must be much, much more intensity uh, in dialogue between India and Japan, for instance, as to how to build uh, mutual uh, military capabilities. And I would love the Australians to look afresh at uh, Japan's submarine technologies <laughs> that uh, Japan could offer still to the Australians. So uh, that's what I should say. Uh, we're, we're talking a, a lot about semiconductors and resilient uh, supply chain and so on and so forth. But I, I would like to come back again, again to the core crux of the uh, arrangement. Now, 
Well, let me just uh, uh, add something about uh, the uh, previous question. South China Sea is very much important in order for China to hide its nuclear powered uh, attack submarines. But over the next five, six years, it's going to be very much a, um, a, a critical period as to what could happen over Taiwan. Xi Jinping is going to get elected again, third time in a row this uh, autumn. And he's going to be given a five year term that would expire in 2027. The next five years is going to be a window in which Xi Jinping must prove that he has uh, fulfilled the pledge to bring back the Chinese dream, bring back the so-called territorial integrity. And then if you lose Taiwan from the equation, you will have had an entirely different security picture uh, throughout the Indo-Pacific region. Um, so Taiwan is the focal point. And I don't think Quad could change in any way the Chinese behavior over Taiwan or over South China Sea. But the question to be posed is the following. Were it not for our grouping, were it not for Quad, would that be, what kind of environment would that be? Um, What's lacking in China is this grouping. President, uh, sorry, uh, Ambassador Emmanuel, uh, uh, Ambassador Emmanuel from the United States, Ram Emanuel from the United States famously has said a number of times, you, we don't have to isolate China because China is already isolated. They don't have allies. They don't have friends to count upon. Uh, we have a group of like-minded countries. And that actually uh, gives um, uh, positive, um, uh, positive incentives uh, throughout the region and to the, to, the, to, to the Chinese as well. ASEAN centrality, someone uh, asked that question as well. Uh, very briefly, ASEAN has never taken up a role to look beyond Southeast Asia. So their focus is very much regional. And when it comes to Southeast Asian nations, um, we all value ASEAN's contribution. And I think ASEAN is entitled sit, to sit behind the wheel when it comes to the ASEAN matters, Southeast Asian matters. But when it comes to broader Indo-Pacific region, I think that's the quad that should play a role. Thank you. Right. From the U.S. perspective, Manisha, you asked me as well on this one. I mean, it comes up a lot, you know, and I would say especially to uh, to Tom's point on the defense side, um, where India kind of holds it out as, you know, one of those things India would like to see crossed for the next evolution in defense cooperation. And, and I'll say from the U.S. perspective, uh, we've, we've tried more things with India than with any other country. Um, but it's really, really hard because almost all U.S. defense tech is held by the private sector. So how do you go to a private company and say, you know, India wants access to the root technology to develop on their own. You know, can we give it to them? You know, the answer is going to be no, as it should be. You know, no private firm that invested in that would ever want to give that up voluntarily. But they tried. They created the Defense Technology and Trade Initiative, where they went and they actually got hundreds of platforms that at least they were willing to engage in conversation. You know, we had a dozen conversations. There's a few projects they tried to get off the ground. But when it comes to contracting, you know, it's been really hard. They created uh, the only country in the world that has a program like that. The only country in the world that has a dedicated team inside the Pentagon, it's called the India Rapid Reaction Cell, um, and uh, their job is to expedite technology transfer approvals. But you know, again, uh, you know, India is a reluctant buyer sometimes. Even when India says they want to move in new domains and acquire new technologies, we pre-approve things even before the process is moving, and it never gets bought. You know, how many times can you go through that? So matching up the systems is still something that I think we have to uh, continue to work on and, and strengthen and improve. We are unilaterally freeing a lot of our control regimes. So India can buy most of the areas of technology. So when they say they want it, you know, we may not be able to give it, but it is for sale. Um, and, then, uh, and then of course, signing the, the cooperative agreements, uh, the, the geospatial agreement, the CONCASA, things like that. So, so we are clearing the decks of a lot of things the governments can do. 
But unfortunately, you know, what a lot of times any puts on the table is access to root technology defense equipment that the government cannot do because it's controlled by the private sector. Now, the one other avenue that I think that we may have some promise, uh, well, I'd say two, one is the Quad, quad uh, Fellows Program. If our kids are jointly researching, coming up with the next big idea, it's, it's laying seeds and, and probably it's our kids that are going to see the, uh, you know, the real gestation from that. But it's got to start from there, you know, because if, if Lockheed invested $20 billion in building something, they're not going to hand it over. But if we have really smart kids getting together and they're co-ideating and they come up with something new, that, that adds a little more promise. Second is, um, I think the aircraft carrier working group is a model we should be looking to replicate. You know, showcase um, great technologies that are on offer, not just like saying that we approved a, a control regime. But you know, to bring Indian folks on U.S. aircraft carriers and showcase the technologies, and is, as India is building their own, I think replicating that. And, and the one project I think we should do immediately is creating a similar working group on the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. You know, India's strategic dominance of that is going to be really important for the United States to sit there and showcase all the sensing technology, port security technologies. You know, and, and do a couple of showcase demonstration programs that can really get the most out of this important, you know, listening post and, and stuff would be phenomenal. But, you know, those kind of things like our aircraft carrier working groups should replicate it um, to showcase, you know, what these technologies can do better than, you know, we'd ever do simply by moving an export control regime. So there's a few ideas. All right, uh, thanks for that, uh, Rick. Uh, now probably last, second last question. Uh, you know, uh, question from uh, Dean Narayana. She asked, uh, should port be expanding? Uh, do, uh, I mean, uh, should the grouping invites other members to expand its influence, make it uh, more effective? Uh, what is the view of the panel? Uh, anyone can briefly talk about it. Dr. Gupta, Nancy, uh, Lisa, yeah. any idea? Uh, I mean, do you have any view on this? I just want to. Uh, just say something uh, as far as the expansion just put that aside for a second living here in japan we need much more discussion about security about defense than is going on and part of the reason it doesn't go on is because it's a sensitive issue when you talk about the military the u.s military is here Many Japanese on the mainland have never even been to Okinawa, where the dominant forces are. And that peace brand of Japan has really been formidable for 70 plus years. And so when you raise questions of increasing the defense budget, maybe one point from 1% 1 of GDP to 1.5, probably not up to 2%, or you, um, you talk about uh, adjusting the constitution and uh, changing the uh, dynamic of the self-defense forces. We're just not having that conversation, not at the university by and large, not in the general population. It's a sensitive issue. And I think that has to change the way it could be changed is if we talk about it broadly as peace and stability and defense <laughs> because people can relate to defending sovereignty territory those democratic values that were mentioned earlier anyone uh, would you like to comment on it on expansion of the poll yeah uh, i think uh, this is uh, still a work in progress and uh, it's perhaps too early uh, for uh, any new members to come in. Uh, the Quad has to prove itself first. Uh, so I would say that uh, this is probably not the right time to take in uh, new members. But at the same time, uh, the four countries alone cannot uh, implement all the big agenda that they have uh, taken on board. So engagements should be uh, a preferred way of doing it. And uh, they must uh, think of some mechanisms whereby they can engage with the other countries. Right. Uh, I, would, I would agree. Uh, the name speaks for itself. It's a group of four 
countries. Right. So uh, it takes a little bit of time for, for it to establish right. firm brand recognition, so to say. Right. Now, um, Nancy, uh, a lot of debate has been going on about uh, security. Abe's prime minister's office was surrounded by hundreds of thousands of people every day, seven days a week, when Shinzo Abe tried hard to uh, uh, legislate a new security bill. So um, I do understand why, why you say what you, what you, what you just said, but um, this country has gone quite a far. And the Japanese defense spending as opposed to its GDP is 1.24 1. if you adopt <laughs> NATO standard to um, a minor correction, if I may. Uh, I was just, just going to add that, okay, um, go ahead. Sorry, Arvin, uh, that, I mean, there's been a bit of debate here in Australia about quad plus uh, for a while, um, you know, to include South Korea. I mean, I, I you know, I, I, I agree with, uh, you know, everyone else is just that it, it's the quad. It's already got six le leader le le level working groups. It's got a huge agenda already. I, I don't see at this stage the value of of quad plus, but it could be something that could be developed uh, into the future, depending on you know what what plays out in the region. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add, you know, protest is one thing, that's not the same as debate. So, I mean, people were protesting, I agree, because they wanted to, they, they like living with the idea of a nonviolent nation and a peaceful nation. It's very attractive to other people throughout the world to come to Japan, which stands for peace and nonviolence. So I'm just saying that you have to put it in a larger context and have full-fledged debate, which, you know, people protesting, that went away. They're not protesting on that now, but they will if we uh, raise this issue again. You know, in the Japanese language, um, magazines and newspapers, hardly a day goes by without uh, looking at those discussions going on. Uh, right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, very distinguished speakers, fabulous audience, which has been there right till the end. Uh, the time has come to uh, conclude this webinar. There are many questions that have been sent on email as well, but we cannot possibly go on, especially with speakers from Australia and Japan who probably may be feeling a little sleepy. Uh, but that apart, this discussion can go on and on. Thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, this is an ongoing debate for remains a work in progress. And uh, what is really is surprising is that the grouping, which was almost written off uh, three, four years ago, till there was a quiet meeting in Singapore, uh, not so, oh, sorry, Singapore, in Manila, 2017. And that set in motion a chain of events leading to the resurrection of the grouping. And now what we see, the four summits in person. So thought remains a work in progress, it's evolving, is branching out into uh, new ideas. And, uh, you know, as the topic is, uh, the webinar would title, slowly, possibly, there is something called the Quad Way, which is probably uh, getting firmed up. And Quad is entrenching its reputation as a, as a force for good. And in the end, it will not be geopolitics or even geoeconomics but very concrete benefits to transform the lives of people in the region. And that will be the yardstick by which that's what we judge. We can go on. Uh, thanks so much. I just like to conclude, uh, you know, uh, with something which Prime Minister Modi said in the address to the U.S. House of Congress in uh, 2016. And you were talking in the context of India-U.S. relations where he had said that the orchestra have sufficiently tuned their instrument. The Beethoven has given the signal. There's a new symphony in play. He was quoting Walt Whitman, the American. So there is a new symphony here, uh, which is in play among the major liberal uh, democracies spanning three continents. And there is so much more to do. 
for peace and prosperity of the region and the world and humanity. Thank you once again for your contribution. We will be publishing the proceedings of this webinar in the next edition of our magazine, which will come out within a week's time. We'll get back to some of uh, to you. If you have anything more to add to that, that would be great because I want it to be a future-looking document that last 90 minutes have generated some concrete suggestion to take the court forward onto the next page. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Bye for right. now. Thank you. See you again. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.